Okay, good evening, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard. I'm Director of Events, and we're very pleased to welcome you to our kickoff event for Litquake, fiction, first fiction, Ties That Bind. Uh, of course, we've been a partner with Litquake from the very beginning, and we have a wonderful array of events that are coming up, which I'll give you a little rundown in a minute. Uh, but first, I'd like to invite those of you who are new to our institute to come on Wednesday for our free tour. Uh, Wednesday at noon, librarians will take you through our vast and beautiful general interest library, which is on the second and third floors. You'll see our international chess club, which is right down the hallway. And you'll get an introduction to our incredible history, starting in 1854 and also get an introduction to the various programs and activities that happen here. We have writers groups. We have our author programs, panel discussions on topical issues, a Friday night cinema lit film series, and of course the chess club has ongoing tournaments and classes for chess players of all ages and backgrounds. And we have all this happening under one roof, seven days a week. So we really hope that you'll take a tour of the library and our institute. You'll find out about us and join, become a member, and be part of our ever-growing literary and cultural community here at 57 Post Street. I also want to make mention about the upcoming Litquake events. Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, we have a literary lunch, literary lunch, The World of Elena Ferrante, with uh, Professor Sarah Marinelli. Then in the evening on Wednesday, October 11th at 6.30, Maximum Punch, Minimum Words, the short story, the short fiction of Barry Gifford, uh, we who we know well here, who will be in conversation with author Tom Barbash. And then on Thursday again, we'll have a literary lunch. Uh, that's at 12.30. Um, it's about Jane Eyre, who turns 170 with Mallory Ortberg. In the evening on Thursday, uh, October 12th at 6.30, we have a panel discussion, Gotta Get Out of Here, Why We Love Science Fiction and Fantasy, uh, with Nick Canis, Meg Ellison, Jonathan Keats, Pat Murphy, and moderated by Ransom Stevens. So we hope you'll join us for that program as well. And then to cap the whole week, we have a program with author Eric Lax, who's coming up from Hollywood, for his new book about the art and process of screenwriting of Woody Allen. And that program will be moderated by film critic David Thompson. So we do hope you'll join us for some of our upcoming programs this week. Also next week, we have The Future of Housing in San Francisco. That's on October 18th. See our website and join us for programs. And now I'd like to introduce David Morris, who will be introducing our program. David. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, I'm David Morris from uh, the Litquake Committee. I want to thank you all for coming. This is Litquake's 18th festival. Um, we are also a resident here, uh, very happily so, of the Mechanics Institute. Our offices are just upstairs. And uh, thanks for coming to, uh, you know, uh, First Fiction, The Ties That Bind. Um, this is a, where we're going to have a, a panel discussion here. Uh, with uh, two critically acclaimed first-time authors. Uh, our Litquake Festival began last Thursday. Uh, it continues through this coming, coming Saturday. Uh, through the course of our festival, we have about 850 authors. Uh, so there are events every day. There are programs uh, at the door. Uh, if you want to take one, please feel free to do so. You, it's uh, a little difficult to keep track uh, if you don't have a program. Or uh, you can look us up on litquake.org. It all culminates Saturday night, this coming Saturday night, down in the Mission District with 102 different venues spread over three different phases in four hours. And so you have an incredible choice of over 30 per hour of different events that you can attend. It's, it's really something that's become quite a San Francisco event. Um, I d have put out some surveys in your chairs. Please don't be afraid of them. Uh, our grant givers uh, definitely want to know who attends our events. So that would be tremendously helpful to us if you could fill those out. Uh, speaking of our sponsors, very important to thank them publicly. It would be the Grants for the Arts, the Minor Anderson Family Foundation, 
Margaret and William R. Hurst the Third Foundation, the Jack and Rose Omen Foundation, the Craig Newmark Foundation, California Arts Council, Walter and Elise Haas Fund, and our media sponsors, San Francisco Chronicle, KALW, KQED, 7x7, Johnny Funcheap, Bar Tab, and 48 Hills. I uh, also want to remind you that 85% uh, of our events are free to the public, uh, especially the, the uh, lit crawl that I mentioned on Saturday night are all completely free. Uh, so if you believe in keeping literature a key component of the city's cultural land, landscape, uh, please support us. Uh, we do accept donations, of course. Uh, we've gone a little bit high tech. Uh, you can reach us on uh, Venmo. Uh, you just uh, type in at Litquake, uh, PayPal, info at litquake.org, or on our website, litquake.org. I would like to, uh, please, to uh, introduce our fabulous panel. Uh, tonight, our, our first-time authors are first, to your right, uh, Rachel Kong. Uh, Rachel grew up in Southern California and holds degrees from Yale University and the University of Florida. From 2011 to 2016, she was the managing editor, then executive editor, of Lucky Peach Magazine. Her fiction and nonfiction have appeared in Tin House, Joyland, American Short Fiction, The San Francisco Chronicle, The Believer, and California Sunday. She lives right here in San Francisco. Her first novel is Goodbye Vitamin. In our center here, uh, we're pleased to have Margaret Wilkerson Sexton, born and raised in New Orleans, another one of my favorite cities, uh, where she studied creative writing, well, excuse me, not there, but she studied creative writing at Dartmouth and uh, law at UC Berkeley. A recipient of the Lombard Fellowship she spent a year in the Dominican Republic working for a civil rights organization and pursuing her writing. Her work has been nominated for a Pushkar Prize, and her stories have been published or are forthcoming in the Massachusetts Review, Gray Sparrow Journal, Limestone Journal, and Broad Magazine. She lives right here in the Bay Area. Her debut novel is A Kind of Freedom. Our moderator this evening, to your far left, will be, will be Megan Ward. She is the author of Runway, Confessions of a Not-So-Supermodel, a chronicle of six years spent working as a high fashion model in Paris, London, Tokyo, and Milan. She is also a freelance writer whose work has appeared mo mostly in The Rumpus, San Francisco Magazine, 7x7, uh, and in the anthologies It's So You, 35 Women Write About Personal Expression Through Fashion and Style, and Wake Up and Smell the Shit. Hilarious travel disasters. Thank you, and Megan, please take it away. Thank you. Well, I'm honored to be here tonight with these fantastic authors. Both of their books are amazing, and you should buy them both and get them signed tonight. Go home and read them right away. Um, a quote about Margaret's book, A Kind of Freedom, this luminous and assured first novel shines an unflinching, compassionate light on three generations of a black family in New Orleans, emphasizing endurance more than damage. So first I'd like to ask Margaret to read a passage from A Kind of Freedom. Sure, I'll just, um, I'll read from the first chapter. And as some of you may know, the book is, it takes place in three generations, spanning uh, World War II to post-Katrina. And um, the sections weave in and out of each other, so there would be a section from World War II, and then it would go into the 80s, and then post-Katrina. And um, the section I'll read from first is, uh, is from the winter of 1944. Evelyn, winter 1944. Later, Evelyn would look back and remember that she wasn't the one who noticed Renard first. No, it was her sister, Ruby, who caught the too short right hem of his suit pants in her side view. Ruby was thicker than Evelyn, not fat by a long shot, but thick in a way that prevented her from ever feeling comfortable eating. Her favorite food was red beans and rice, and Monday was hard on her. Their mother would boil a big pot and feel relieved, two pounds plenty to feed the family for at least three days, but Ruby felt taunted by the surplus. She'd cut in and out of the kitchen the beginning of the week, sneaking deep bowls of rice and applying as little gravy as she could 
to maintain the flavor but not alert her family to her excess. Then on Thursday, she'd examine the consequences. It would start in the morning on the way into school. Ruby attended vocational school and Evelyn attended Dillard University, but their campuses were only a few blocks apart and they walked the majority of the way together. My thighs are touching, Ruby would say, as if they just started touching the minute before. Mm -hmm. You can't see it though, Evelyn would assure her, her own legs so far apart another leg could fit between them. Who are you fooling with? You can't see it. Anybody with eyes could see it. You don't even need to have eyes, you just need ears and you could hear my thighs swishing together. You can't hear anything so soft, Evelyn would go on, and she'd spend the rest of the day wading through that topic. Just when she'd think she got to flat land, Ruby would pull her back into the murk with a question about her behind. Matters would improve a little on Friday, but Ruby would maintain an edge around her even then, and everyone near her felt the prick. Today was a Friday. His pants legs are uneven, Ruby said, about the new boy standing on North Claiborne and Esplanade, wearing a brown wool suit, a gray V-neck sweater beneath the jacket. He stood next to Andrew, whom all the girls fawned over at the debutante ball last season. Evelyn's own escort had been second in charm. He had even silenced her nerves by pointing out his friend's waltzing mishaps, but despite her mother's urgings, she hadn't accepted his visit. And a week later, when his interest subsided, she couldn't help but sigh. She looked up now, exhaled the smoke of the cigarette dangling from her fingers. It was still early February, and the winter air hadn't lost its chill. Still all the Seventh Ward girls congregated after school outside Dufon's Oyster Shop, the best Negro-owned restaurant in the city, and smoked. Evelyn had come to relish the anticipation of the first slight inhale. She was a lady, and the long release afterward. She would never have referred to herself as an anxious person. Ruby had claimed that role in the family, but any nerves that jingled inside her settled at just the thought of a drag. She blew the smoke out of the side of her mouth so as not to hit her sister and smiled at the thought of the uneven him. Maybe he was in a rush. Even still, Ruby said, breathing in so sharply she almost made herself choke. He might have found time to even out his pants hems, she laughed. Cute though. Too brown for most people, but it is a nice shade of brown. Evelyn nodded. Cute he was. Men and women rushed past them, bustling in and out of offices and stores. The Boots Seed and Feed, Queen of the South Coffee, Miller Funeral Home, Meriwether's Photography, Beigeois Cut Rate Pharmacy, the Sweet Tooth Ice Cream Parlor, and Fine Time Billiard Hall. The outdoor market where Evelyn's mother made groceries was just a block away at St. Bernard Avenue and Evelyn could smell the Cajun spices simmering. The butcher let out a high-pitched call, veal to roast and cabbage and green beans. Ruby raised her voice to combat the new noise, and his hair lay so flat, and that's not a conk either. The uneven man looked over at the girls then, and Evelyn held his gaze for less than a second. So quick, if he doubted it had happened, he could convince himself it hadn't. She shook her head back at her sister. No, much more natural looking than a conch. All that, but he couldn't hem the pants evenly. I wouldn't have ever noticed those pants if you hadn't hit me over the head with it, Ruby, Evelyn said, though it wasn't true. It was clear that despite his press suit and neat tie, the uneven man didn't belong among the passe blancs he stood with. No, not with their damn near white skin, straight black hair and even straighter noses, their mustaches like silk against their lips and she didn't know what possessed her to declare otherwise. She liked what she'd said, though. Not only that, but the fact that she said it. And for the rest of the day, whenever she thought of the uneven man, she thought of the weight of her voice when it came out firm. Okay, um, Goodbye Vitamins is a quietly brilliant disquisition on family relationships and adulthood told in prose that is so startling in its spare beauty that I find myself thinking about how Kong's turns of phrases, I found myself thinking about Kong's turn of, turns of phrases for days after I finished reading. 
Rachel, could you read a passage for us? Sure, yeah. I'm also just going to read from the beginning of the book. December 26. Tonight, a man found Dad's pants in a tree lit with Christmas lights. The stranger called and said, I have some pants belonging to a Howard Young. Well, shit, I said. I put the phone down to verify that Dad was home and had pants on. He was and did. Yesterday, on Mom's orders, I'd written his name and our number in permanent marker onto the tags of all his clothes. Apparently, what he's done in protest is pitch the numbered clothing into trees. Up and down Euclid, his slacks and shirts hang from the branches. The downtown trees have their holiday lights in them, and this man who called had, while driving, noticed the clothes illuminated. December 27. In the morning when I go to fetch them, city workers are removing the lights from the trees and the decorative bows from the lampposts. One man unties a bow and tosses it to his partner on the ground. All the great bright gold bows are piled in the bed of an enormous pickup truck parked in the plaza. In that same plaza, a frustrated man is saying to his dog, why are you being this way? A baby in a stroller is wearing sunglasses. Dad, all my hard work, I say later at home. I've collected a pair of pants, two shirts, a few knotted up ties. Now that's unnecessary, Dad says angrily when I return them. I got here on Christmas Eve. I'm home for the holidays like you're supposed to be. It's the first time in a long time. Under ordinary circumstances, the circumstances ha that had become ordinary, I would have gone to Joel's. His mother would have popped popcorn for garlands and his father would have baked a stolen. His twin brother would have hit on me. In the bathroom, there would have been a new grocery brand toothbrush with a gift label on it, my name and his mother's handwriting, Ruth. This year, with nowhere to go, no Joel and no Charleston, I made the drive down. It's been three or four Christmases away. From San Francisco, where I live, it would have been an easy six hours south. Up to you, Joel would say, but I always chose Charleston. Merry Christmas, we tell our parents, my parents over speakerphone. Christmas morning, Dad pulled out a small, worn red notebook. He explained he's kept it since I was very little. Inside, there are letters to me. He'd been waiting for the proper time to share them, but it had slipped his mind, wouldn't you know, until now. He showed me a page from this notebook. Today you asked me where metal comes from. You asked me what flavor are germs. You were distressed because your pair of gloves had gone missing. When I asked you for a description, you said, they're sort of shaped like my hands. <laughs> then he closed the notebook very suddenly and said, as though angry, that's enough. December 29th. Now mom is asking if I could stay a while to keep an extra eye on things. By things, she means dad, whose mind is not what it used to be. It comes as a surprise. Things aren't so bad. Dad doesn't seem any different, on top of which my mother hates to ask for anything. Just the year, mom repeats when I can't manage to answer. Think about it. On the way to, my, on the, way to the bathroom, I catch my mother shouting, no, 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 you're expensive to a vitamin she's dropped. Ginkgo, I think. The first thing started approximately last year. Dad forgetting his wallet, forgetting faces, forgetting to turn the faucet off. Then it was bumping into things and feeling tired, even after full nights of sleep. That he'd been a drinker, Dr. Lung said, didn't help. There is presently no single test or scan that can diagnose dementia with complete accuracy. It's only after the person is dead that you can cut his or her brain open and look for telltale plaques and tangles. For now, it's a process of elimination. What we have are tests that rule out other possible causes of memory loss. In diagnosing Alzheimer's, doctors can only tell you everything that it isn't. What my father doesn't have, hyperthyroidism, a kidney or liver disorder, an infection, a nutritional deficiency. Deficiencies of vitamin B12 and folic acid can cause memory loss and are treatable. I'm just straight up demented, Dad says. Thank you. Okay, so since the name of our panel is The Ties That Bind, I want to start by talking about family and what role family plays in each of your novels. Um, so both books have daughters who have rifts with their fathers. 
So I wanted to ask you about why did you choose to focus on the father-daughter relationships more than the mother-daughter relationships? Hmm. Margaret? Um, that's a good question. I, I think, in, in, for, for instance, in the first section, the Evelyn section, it wasn't a conscious choice, but because of the, the dichotomy that I wanted to set up in the book, which was that um, there, was this, there was this path of progression, and then there was this path of regression, and at least seemingly, and the main character, Evelyn, had to choose which one to go down. And because her father was the symbol of progression, this educated doctor in the 40s, this educated African-American doctor, um, which was so unusual at that time for historic reasons, but um, because he was the symbol of, of stability and even progression in the book, and she had to make a decision between progression and, and what felt like it would look like regression, she, she had to go against her father. And so it wasn't so much that I consciously chose to have that relationship, um, you know, fleshed out more because she did have conflict with her mother too. It was just that the central, one of the central themes of this book was, you know, what constitutes moving forward and what constitutes staying still or moving backward and, and what decisions um, lead to which path and also who can afford to take chances that might lead to regression? So you have someone in the 40s, um, Evelyn's character, who's, uh, who's African-American and she's a woman, and um, you know, she's in the height of Jim Crow, and she, she can't afford to make a decision based on love that might hold her back. And so that was more what I was getting at there. And even in the, in the next section with Jackie, where there's a rift between um, the daughter and the father, it was a symbol of the rift between progress and what might have looked like staying still. Yeah, I think for me also, I mean, it wasn't, um, it's hard to answer that question a little bit because it wasn't so much a conscious choice. It was, um, I think, um, the family kind of um, exploring the family and the relationships in that family were how uh, the characters really came to be. And so I think sometimes in families there are um, alliances that happen maybe. And so in the book, uh, the main character, Ruth, she's sort of allied with her father and um, the mother has more of a re relationship with Ruth's brother. Um, and so, you know, there are these pairings that happen, I think, in families kind of naturally for whatever reasons um, they are probably reasons as mysterious as why <laughs> I decided to focus on the father. But I, I did know that I wanted, um, like Margaret said, like the father's, I think profession was um, crucial to the book. Um, I was also interested in the way that the mother's character in my book um, was sort of off to the side. She was, she had been for many years the caretaker um, in all sorts of ways. and and the more accommodating one, um, which I think is a role that women often find themselves in. And so I was interested in having this narrator come home um, ostensibly for the reason of taking care of her father and then realizing in that process like how much her mother had also been um, wronged in many ways. Okay, and in Goodbye Vitamin, Goodbye Vitamin is much about reconnecting with family. So Ruth, you know, when she comes home, it's been several years since she's come home. Her mother, you know, says, why didn't you ever come? Um, so is this story about redemption or forgiveness? Um, I think it's about, uh, I, so it spans a year. I think that there's a lot that is complicated about families that cannot be fixed in a single year. Um, I, I don't think it's quite about uh, redemption completely, but I think the characters in the book do make steps toward that and start and toward, you know, forgiving one another for various things. Yeah. Do you think it's Ruth Moore who's seeking redemption, or the father, or forgiveness? Um, I think that, um, I, so I think that um, Ruth is, so Ruth is a character in the book who is um, 
moving home in part for this kind of noble reason of taking care of her father, but also mostly because she doesn't know what to do next and she's not quite figured out what her life um, should be or should look like. And so I think that um, for all of the characters in the book who are sort of just bumbling around, they're, they're not, there's no mm -hmm. goal for them. They're not mm -hmm. quite sure what okay. they should be seeking or, yeah. you know, like um, they know in general that they should be better people to one another, I think. Okay, and speaking of bumbling around, um, <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, in your book, um, the characters are largely bumbling around. They're, they're um, failing in a lot of ways. Um, you know, they make a lot of promises that they don't keep. Renard promises he'll go to med school. Terry promises he'll quit doing drugs. TC promises he's not going to deal drugs anymore. Um, are these characters... Are they heroes? Are they failures? How would you mm -hmm. yeah, classify um, them? Huh. Well, I think they're they're just human. You know, I think they're both. They're they obviously fail, and um, you brought up very you know crucial ways in which they fail, and you're right, they do. But it's funny before you mentioned the examples, I was thinking. Did, are they failures? I, it, it hadn't crossed my mind, but you're right. I mean, they do fail in these major ways, but I, I just thought of them as human. I just thought of them, um, especially characters like Terry, uh, who's struggling with addiction and um, a victim of the mishandling of the crack epidemic in the 80s, in my opinion, and, um, and especially TC, who's you know a symbol of the problem of mass incarceration in the country. And, um, and especially uh, Renard, who's, who wants to be a doctor and who, who um, in another demographic, would have been very well set up to be a doctor, but it's the 40s and, it's, you know, like I said, it's the height of Jim Crow. Um, there are personal failings there, but they're compounded by the systemic failures, which are, um, of course, making it harder for, for these humans to um, succeed against all odds. And um, so, you know, when I was writing it, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying to make them these people who didn't fail at all t to symbolize the, the grave failures in this country. I wasn't trying to do that because it's not really the human situation. I mean, when you look at the human situation, you have personal contributions that you've made to failings in your life, and then you have external factors that have contributed to failings in your life, and that's, that's just what it is. It's, it's both. But what I am trying to say is some, some demographics seem to have more leeway. Um, and it's not just race, it's class as well. And some, some demographics have more leeway with mistakes. And, um, and, and so I wanted to depict that. And I also wanted to um, show in the, in the combination of their heroics and their failings, I wanted to show them as people. So you know the reader could, um, could imagine themselves as these characters and imagine what it might be like with their restrictions um, or just see them in a way um, that would make them independent from the stereotypes that some of these groups often fall into. Okay, so while we're on the topic of race, I wanted to ask both of you what role race plays in your book. So, so yours, like you mentioned, begins with 1944 Jim Crow. Um, era in the South, and then it takes us all the way through post-Katrina in 2010. And ironically, you know, things haven't improved for these, you know, you, you imagine progress mm -hmm. throughout the generations, mm -hmm. and things seem to just keep getting worse and worse for this family. The, the protagonist's father is a doctor, and things kind of go downhill from there. Mm -hmm. So could you, could you tell us about what role race plays in your book and, and racism? Well, um... You know, it's. I think it's. I think it's very subtle. Like I think the reader. My hope is that the reader reading the book isn't going to feel bogged down by a sermon on race or a lecture on race. I think my hope is that you know you read the book and you think you're reading about a family and you're reading about siblings' relationships with each other and and like you said, a daughter's relationship with her father, and um, and so that's my hope. But. But beneath it, I, I do have a message, like I have a thesis, and I, I do want to say that in some ways, um, racism in this country, despite the obvious progress, 
the country is made around race in many ways. There are still some pockets of the African American community that are um, that are as limited as as African Americans were under the Jim Crow South regime. And um, so I, I did want to point that out, and that's why it does look like there's a decline, even though it's it's very ironic. It's not one you would expect. Um, but in this book, with this family, there is a decline. You start out with a man in the um, in the 40s who's a doctor, and his family is the wealthiest one on the block, and you know they, they do very well, and they're very stable, and they really don't have much interaction with the white world. It's a very um, it's a very sheltered life that they live in this um, largely African American Creole community, and um, and then you know as the as things progress, you just see that this this main character, Evelyn, her grandson, is doing markedly worse than she was doing. And it's totally unexpected, but it is, it is the way that I wanted to show that in many ways um, things have gotten worse. And there have been um, systemic replacements for Jim Crow that have sprung up to do the work that Jim Crow was doing. Okay, great. And um, Rachel, what about you? So your um, protagonist, Ruth, is half Chinese and half white. Her, her mother's Chinese, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then her best friend, I think, is half Armenian. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think that in my book, um, uh, race is, I don't know, it doesn't play a huge role in it. Um, I think that that was partly out of, like, fear and inability. Like, I was writing a book for the first, this is, we're, Speaking of first novels, mm -hmm. you know, I was writing a book for the first time, um, trying to figure out how to write a book. Um, there are so many things that I wanted to write about and talk about. Um, and I almost felt like when I was putting together this family, I almost felt like if I made the family Chinese, which is what my family is, um, that there would just be, the book would be so long. There would be so many things to like explain to people who don't know what it is, what being a Chinese family is um, all about. And so I almost just wanted to avoid it. At the same time, I didn't feel like that was totally right either. So what happened in the book is that the the mother, Ruth's mother, is an adopted. Um, has been adopted into a white family, and and race does not play a huge role, but but the main character is mixed race. Her best friend is mixed race. And I think that the ways in which they approach the world and maybe um, feel a little bit insecure in the world um, is reflective of like some of my own experiences, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But I think that I was like, I did feel <laughs> like it was such a huge thing and I didn't want to, um, not address it properly, you know. I think so. I'm working on something new. I'm writing a lot more about mm -hmm. race and about mm -hmm. identity, and it feels like that's something that's central to this next project. For, for this mm -hmm. one, I I wanted to talk about memory, and I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. family. And mm -hmm. um, had I been a second time novelist, maybe I would have known how to weave all those things together. But I think that I was like, what the hell am I even doing? <laughs> like, I can't write a book, let alone write a book about like all of the complicated mm -hmm. aspects about being, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a minority in this country. Okay, great. Okay, so speaking of memory, um, memory plays a very important role in your book, both of them, but it, especially in yours. Um, and the obvious way is that Howard, the dad, is losing his memory. Um, but also in the written records that both Howard and Ruth keep. So Ruth entire book, this the book, is a written record. It's her diary of that year. Um, she also quotes her father's notes about things that she did when she was a kid. And, and there's a turning point in the book where, you know, she begins writing notes to her father. Um, could you talk a little bit about the role memory plays? Sure. I mean, I think it's um, was probably the biggest role in the book, and mm -hmm. that was really what I was thinking about as I was writing it. I was really interested in, um, you know, I think the father has, the father's Alzheimer's diagnosis is a very, like, obvious and pointed way in which um, memory is um, present in the book and the, and the reason that the characters are all thinking about it. But I did want to explore, too, just um, the ways in which 
memory is just like the stuff that we all have to make sense of relationships we have with one another and also just our own narratives in our own lives. And I have always been really kind of obsessed with memory as um, just a really imperfect medium for doing that, right? And I think even writing itself is a way to try to fight against it, even though like when you write things down, you're almost like committing things to memory in a very specific way too. Like there's a way in which writing itself is very flawed because it's only making a note of specific and certain things. And so I was just interested in, yeah, like looking at memory um, in a few different ways, like through this very specific disease, but also just in these like really small misunderstandings between people and just the ways in which, um, yeah, it's a flawed medium and yet this is like what we have mm -hmm. as humans to work with, really. Okay, Margaret, what about you? Do you feel memory played a role in your book too? Hmm. A bigger, um, bigger scale. <laughs> yeah, I, that's right. I mean, hmm, the legacy of of racism, I guess. But I let me think about that a little bit. Um, well, so your book is so, so both of you have very um, non traditional structures to your book. So yours follows you know, three different characters from three different generations, and it alternates back and forth between the different characters. Um, did you, how did you come up with that structure? Did, did, you, it, did it happen sort of organically as you were writing, or did you plan that out ahead of time? Yeah, I always, I mean, it happened organically, and it was planned. I, I always mm -hmm. knew it would, it would end with the, um, the earliest section. OK. Um, and I, I suspected it would alternate back and forth, although at one point I considered doing blocks, like I considered doing the post-Katrina section first, and then the 80 section, and then the 40 section as blocks, okay. so that you wouldn't, um, you know, so, so that you would read it just one, one story all the way through, and the next story all the way through, and you wouldn't alternate back and forth. Um, I, well, I'll speak to why I decided to end it with the early part. I, I just thought the gravity of the of um, of the situation that this family is in, in the sense that that they they're experiencing this drastic decline, and and much of that is due to systemic factors. I thought the gravity of that would hit the reader really hard if you ended on this really positive note and in, in a really early period where the where the characters themselves are full of hope, but they're full of hope, and yet as the reader you know that there's not much that's coming that's positive for them. That the 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 highlight of their lives is really behind them. So I thought that, the, I thought that would really hit a chord emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, what I've learned is it not only does that, but it also, I think, makes the book um, palatable in a way. Because I think it's hard to read a book that's all sadness and all depression and, and, and all going downhill. You have to have some life in it. It's like one of my teachers told me, you can't write about sadness. You can't write about sadness and really like convey that emotion unless there's joy in the pages too. You have to have both chords hitting or the, the gravity of the sadness won't be, it won't be felt. But so here, you know, what I learned is that ending on that positive note really, um, it, I think it really, it, 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 it gave the, like people have said that the book is, you know, it's obviously about a decline and it's obviously about systemic failures, but there's also a streak of endurance and resilience in it. And I think that's why. I think it's because I ended with a positive note and then also throughout the book you just have these families interspersing and you just have, you know, relationships between siblings mm -hmm. and you have like ordinary life going on, um, people falling in love, you know, basically it's three love stories. And... Um, I think I think that you know makes it more mixed and and more um, more uh, tolerable because it is a heavy book. Now you were asking about um, I think I kind of went around memory. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. Um, it, yeah. If you have anything to to add about memory, I don't, not now. In, I mean, yeah, I, it yeah. might come to me in a little bit, but I don't because. The funny thing about this book is although it takes place in three generations, the, the characters aren't, you know that as the reader, but the characters don't. So they're not thinking, oh, I remember Jim mm -hmm. Crow South mm -hmm. when, mm -hmm. you know, they used to tell me, get off the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not really happening that way. It, 
um, it's like the reader is remembering, mm -hmm. but the, right. the characters really aren't, and I think that's right. interesting too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really interesting in books, I think, just that you can mess with time in mm -hmm. this crazy way, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, readers can remember decades and mm -hmm. hundreds of years, and um, that the individuals within that story can't really. Well, and Rachel, so the structure of your book, again, is a uh, format of a diary. Um, did you come up with that idea before you started writing, or was that? Yeah, I mean, I, so I, yeah, I didn't really think of it as a diary. They're dated entries. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, if I, um, I was thinking them more as just um, first person little snippets from days. It's formatted, it's, it basically takes place over the course of one year, and um, it's kind of fragmented, and uh, these it flashes in and out of um, like main plot developments, I guess. Um, it's a lot of just Ruth's observations about day-to-day -day things, and I think that was always something that I was interested in, um, again, just with mm -hmm. the memory, just like what we do write down, what we mm -hmm. commit mm -hmm. to paper, um, and also what gets written down in books, I guess. I think I was interested in writing down the things that get left out of um, like the big sweeping stories about our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, say you're telling somebody your life story mm -hmm. at a campfire, um, you wouldn't necessarily say, like, and then on Monday, I dug some hair out of a bathroom mm -hmm. sink. Mm -hmm. And yet, like, that's the sort of mm -hmm. thing that is in the book. It's really exciting, I promise. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, I think that I was really interested in yeah. just those little moments that get left out and yet are the stuff that mm -hmm. makes up our lives. Yeah, I mean, your book is full of these observations that are hilarious, and there are things that that I never notice in life, and so it made me wonder, you know, are these things that, you, you know, like, do you, you know, walk around with a notebook and <laughs> write down these weird I observations, or do you yeah. just invent them all? Um, yeah. I, I always tell myself to be better about writing things down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like I don't write enough things down as a writer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, they're very yeah. funny. Well, so, and speaking of humor, um, you know, you said you can't have the sadness without the joy, so, you know, your book is very funny, but it really also is a very sad story about um, yeah. Ruth's father suffering yeah. from Alzheimer's. So how did you, you know, balance yeah. that humor well, I, with the sad? I'm totally with Margaret on that. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I think I'm not that interested in reading a story that's all sad or mm -hmm. all funny. You know, like I think um, that life isn't that way and that... Um, I mean, is that, I don't know, is that why it's like you're always crying on airplanes is because like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, it's just, I think that when something is, when you read something that's funny and then maybe a page later it's devastating, like that, those are the books that mm -hmm. stick with me the most mm -hmm. and that I think affect me the most. And so I was interested in, interested in recreating that, but also again, like with these um, details from life and wanting to make it a book that reflected life, I knew that it would have to in involve sadness and humor hand in ha hand. I think, you know, if you go to a funeral, people still make jokes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really, really sad, but you do have to kind of make jokes to cope or to even just remember the life of the person that, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're there to celebrate. Yeah, I and I I've read her book, so I that really resonated with me that um, there was so much vibrancy and humor and love that was coming out of this very sad story, and I thought the balance was perfect. And it reminded me of, you know, because I've been in and out of the hospital with my father, and um, for instance, uh, last year we went eight times in a year because he had been sick, and my husband and I always say man, that was a great year. Even though we were all, you know, we were in the hospital, we bonded with our mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. We were, we just, you know, I, I went to so many family birthday parties, mm -hmm. for instance, because I was there so much. And um, and you do, you just laugh because mm -hmm. you're just sitting there. I mean, we, we spend so much time laughing. So I, I, it really resonated with me. And I really thought that was true to life, the way you balance those Thank two. Okay, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions and then we'll hand it over oh, to the wow. audience. Um, so setting. 
yours is in LA and yours takes place in New Orleans. Um, do you think that, I mean, the, the stuff in your book is so specific to New Orleans. You have the Creole acts, the, the Creole dialect from Evelyn's mother and um, references to Katrina. Do you think that your story could have taken place anywhere other than New Orleans? No, I, I don't. I think um, this book definitely had to happen in New Orleans. One of the reasons, and I always say this, is because um, in order to see a decline like that from a, a very stable, you know, well-to-do family in the 40s to, to a family that's, you know, living paycheck to paycheck in 2010, it's unusual for that for that to happen in a black family uh, in this country because of what we know about history. There just wasn't that much affluence in that demographic in the 40s. But in New Orleans, there was because of the French influence and because mm -hmm. of the population of Creoles and um, how much access they had to uh, property, et cetera, you did see families who were doing okay or doing really well. And so for that decline to be even be realistic, it had to come out of a city like New Orleans. There are other cities too, but New Orleans is, is um, one of the only ones. And then uh, also I just think the book, because we have Katrina, I mean, there's, there aren't many other cities where you could have that, of course. Um, but then it was just, I don't know, it was such a gift to be able to write about New Orleans because you have the, um, the flavors of the foods, you have the, the music, you have the dialect, as you said, and it's just, it, it really imbues the work with so much texture that you don't mm -hmm. have to work that hard to achieve. It's mm -hmm. just there. And, um, and I'm writing a book now that doesn't take place in New Orleans, okay. and it's harder <laughs> because... Well, and it's what you know, too, right? You it's what I know. spent your childhood there. Yeah, it's what I know, and it's just so rich. It's just a rich, rich mm -hmm. place to be able to write about. It just kind of leaps out at you. And Rachel, what about, why did you choose Los Angeles over San Francisco? Um, well, also, first fiction, I wrote mm -hmm. about a place I knew. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in sort of deserty suburbs around okay. Los Angeles, okay. and so this book takes place mm -hmm. in a deserty suburb mm -hmm. near Los Angeles. And I think that, um, yeah, I wanted to write about um, coming home to a place that was not uh, a busy city and coming pl home to a place that you had to sort of invent your own. You had to deal with the people in your house because there was not that much to do outside of mm -hmm. that house. Mm -hmm. um, and also at the same time, um, I think I'm a very like visual writer and I, I like thinking in terms of images. And so I, I had in my head from the very beginning like the Christmas that the book starts with and the Christmas that it ends with being these sunny Christmases where you're, you could be stuck on a freeway looking at a man blasting Christmas music out of mm -hmm, his mm -hmm, car when mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. super bright and sunny outside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, and as a writer, I always like to ask writers what their process is. What is your writing process like, and do you have any writing rituals? Do you get up every morning and write, Margaret? No, I mean, because I have three kids, so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> do you get any writing done at all? <laughs> no, I mean, what I do is I had a sitter. The, when I wrote this book, I only had two kids, and so um, I had a sitter who would come in a few hours a day. And then now they're in school till twelve, so you know you just kind of I, I I have a few hours a day that I'm able to work usually, and so I try to write in that time period. Um, do I have rituals? I always do. I always go all the way through because I know some people do research first and then okay. they write. I do. I write it all the way through and then I go back and um, and then I like fill in the holes with research. But um, I find it's easier for me to do that kind of stuff, the like heavy revision and the research once I have the draft laid out mm -hmm. because I have an incentive because I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, this is almost done. Mm -hmm. It's not really. But I was like, oh, this is mm -hmm. almost done. <laughs> and so I, you know, I just have a few more things that I need to do. <laughs> and so yeah, so that's. That's the thing that has been consistent, I would say, across. Because I wrote a book before this, is why I'm saying always. Okay. Rachel? Um, I don't have three kids. I have zero <laughs> kids. Um, very lazy in comparison. Um, but I do wake up every morning and, and write in the morning. I think I like writing in that uh, period of time when you're sort of not fully awake, because I think mm -hmm. that then I don't second guess myself as much, mm -hmm. and I don't have that like voice in my head telling mm -hmm. me that um, everything is trash. 
Um, so it's good to sort of trick yourself into writing, I think, is my ritual, just to like start writing mm -hmm. um, when you're not fully awake yet, and then just like go for as long as possible. It's, no coffee? I do drink coffee, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One cup of black coffee. <laughs> okay, does anyone have any questions? Uh, was it awkward to like then, like once your family read it, to like for them to see themselves? And I'm sure, I mean, with any book, if you're going to be honest at all, there are going to be positives and negatives that you write about. Um, did you? What were those conversations like once your family started to maybe see themselves in it, or or be like, hey, like, are you, what are you trying to say about me, or uh, something like that? Well, I'm going to push back a little bit because these are fictional pieces and. I think that you know you do steal a lot from life and like people that you know in life, um, and I definitely stole a lot of like things people have said to me. But I don't think that any of the family members in the book are family members that I have in real life. So I wasn't really worried about that at all. I was more worried about the fact that, like I, so I, my family's Chinese. They're immigrants from Malaysia. Uh, my parents are very Christian. Um, they also have, like never read novels in their lives, and so my book was coming out, and there's some, there's like a, I say the word shit on the very first page, like they don't like cursing, um, so I was very nervous about showing that to them, because mm -hmm. they're, they, you know, I've managed to avoid speaking with them about anything controversial in my life, yeah. or just, you know, <laughs> like mostly getting, like just <laughs> living a mostly exemplary life, as like, you know, uh. as far as they're concerned, um, and so I was a little bit nervous about that, but um, but it turned out fine. I think they were just really proud, um, oh. you know. And I think that I had been working for most of my life to like uh, just take away all of their expectations. Like I didn't turn out to be a doctor or an engineer or whatever, or a lawyer. Um, mm. Nothing that made money. <laughs> and so I think that at every step of the way, I've been like, hey, parents, sorry, I'm just gonna do my own thing and I think that they they to their credit have been very supportive of me the whole time and when when my book came out um, or actually before they read the the advanced version and my mom told me that it was the first novel she had ever read and it would be her favorite novel <laughs> and then I also thought what about my next novel does that mean you're not gonna, not gonna read that but uh, yeah she said she didn't like the curse words but mm -hmm. it was all otherwise fine <laughs> Well, um, I can speak to that because I did actually, um, it, I wouldn't say the characters are, well, the characters are loosely based on family members in the sense that um, I get like a vision for a character and, um, and so when I'm beginning the writing process, that's sort of who I'm basing it on visually um, and, and in terms of what I know about that person, but it, it immediately, almost immediately veers drastically away from that person. So the final product, nobody would recognize themselves. I mean, the facts are completely different, but it does start out with, um, with that conception. And I did, I, I had a family member whom I um, spoke with a lot because he is in the demographic that one of my characters is in, TC. And so I would ask him questions about like, you know, language, he's slang that he uses. Um, you know, what his day-to-day -day life is like, just questions to just get the context of his, of his life. Um, but you know what? I would say that, um, that I was a little nervous about that, but I think it helped me to portray the character more humanly because, you know, you are thinking, well, what if this person is going to have an idea that to some extent this character is based on him? Like, it's, it's very different from the original conception, but I did ask him questions about his life and use some of those examples in the book, you know what I mean, with his consent. So it kind of makes you want to really do the character justice because you're like, this, this could be my relative. And I want the relative reading this book to know, I just want to portray him as a human, you mm -hmm. know? And it, it, kind of, it kind of enables you to really get out of the stereotype zone. Hello, how are you? I'm also a writer and artist. I post poetry online. The question is, how did you write the book? On what medium? Did you use paper? Did you type it out? How did you, on what medium did you write your book? 
I Thank typed you. it out on Word. Computer? Computer, yeah. Okay. I mean, but when I was younger, I used to write out everything and then retype and then type it. But, um, and you know, but no, this time I typed it initially. Yes. I also used Word because I can't um, read my own handwriting. It's very <laughs> messy. But I, you know, I actually started using Scrivener for mm -hmm. this next thing that I'm working on because it's just a lot. It would have been helpful for this one too, but I just didn't know it existed. Um, and it kind of breaks things down into smaller pieces and lets you move things around. So I'm not sponsored, but it's a great program. I've heard about <laughs> Scrivener. Yeah. I'm going to try that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, both of you, do you write every day or not? Can you tell me about your writing pattern? I don't, but, but I found that in the beginning, it helped to write every day. But now that I know, you know, I have the habit of it already, so I don't need to do it every day. I wish I could, but I don't need to. But in the beginning, I, I think it was helpful to do it every day, just to build the habit, you know. I don't write on weekends, but I write, like, at least for an hour every day. If I'm really busy, just I set a timer and do at least an hour. Uh, this is for Rachel. When I first uh, came across the title of your book, I thought it was a uh, uh, book on uh, alternative medicine or self-help. Mm -hmm. But uh, the library <laughs> has uh, 200 people waiting for the wow. copy. So uh, I waited, and a few months later, I, I got, uh, got uh, it was my turn. I uh, <laughs> was happy that I waited. <laughs> I have a quick question. Uh, the, the book is uh, focused on, on uh, the father-daughter relationship, but I can imagine that there must be a lot of undercurrents going on between, between Ruth and the mother as well. Yeah. Probably a lot of, for sure, a lot of competition. Uh, so uh, that probably could be easily a different book, uh, but uh, yeah, have you thought about that? Or, uh, a sequel? <laughs> other, exploring the other relationship, you mean? Uh, daughter and mother in terms yeah. of their competition and maybe even anger, hostilities. Well, I definitely wanted that to be a part of the book and I think that that was a relationship that I thought about a lot and um, yeah, that, that I, I think that I explored in this book as much as I could have. I don't think I'm going to write any sequels. <laughs> but but yeah, no, I appreciate your noticing it, and um, it was definitely a, a big uh, component of the book too, and and those relationships. So your mother was not uh, here. Oh yeah. no! Well, again, <laughs> my family was like, "This is not us." Uh, great job, fiction. <laughs> Hi, uh, Margaret. You mentioned that this wasn't your first book you've written before, right? I was just wondering how many books have you guys written that weren't published and how long this one took to write? Well, um, the first one that I wrote took four years and it never got published. And um, I was obsessed with it. And I just thought that was going to be my book. And um, I just, I kept working on it and working on it. I, I had an agent, but the agent couldn't sell it. And, um, and then finally, I, I joined this like uh, year-long narrative program where we had to start a new book to be to uh, to be eligible for the program. So I wrote this book, but it was like an afterthought. Like, yeah, I'll write this book while I'm still sending out this other book because this is the book, you know. But it um, but it turns out, you know, this book it was like it's funny. This book took about eight months, and I know, right? And the first one again, four years, and never mm -hmm. got published. And this one, I think I saw the fruit of all that effort, and it, it just happened very quickly. Yeah. This was definitely my first novel and my first novel attempt, but it took me a long time. I started it in maybe 2009 or 2010, and so like the writing of it was five years, and then publishing it was another two years. So it took a long time, and I wrote short stories before that and thought that I would have a short story collection, um, and then just couldn't, I just realized that it was, having a short story collection would have been so hard because I was like so obsessive and so 
like angry with each one of the stories. And so I think at some point I was like, I'll just write a novel and then I'll just have one thing to hate instead of <laughs> 10 things to hate. So it was a very practical motive for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it took a long time. Things take a long time. Yeah, that's true. First of all, congratulations. This writing a novel is no uh, small feat to both of you. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to hear if there were sections of your book that um, you got feedback or when you read it felt like you had to completely rewrite it and or start over somewhere. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the process of revising and restarting something and how you found your way out of it? I, I could, as a <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, can, um, I can go first. So the Jackie section, which is a third of the book, um, that was completely, I mean, it was a totally different storyline, like um, very windy and didn't really have a strong resolution because it wasn't really a tracked storyline. I don't think I thought about it enough before I started writing it. And um, it didn't really feed the message of the book as much either. So my editor told me, you know, she had her idea of how I could change it. And I just felt like I tried it, but I just felt like that wasn't working either. And her way would have been a little bit quicker because it wasn't just to scrap the whole thing and start over. But I tried her way and it didn't work out. So I just scrapped it and I just started all over because I, I just felt like there was nothing I could do with that part without just a whole new, um, really a whole new storyline. So I, I came up with a whole new storyline about it. Like I, the whole war on drugs piece wasn't in the book at first. Um, it came about because I was trying to figure out the bridge between Jim Crow and mass incarceration, how you could have, you know, such a such a well-to-do grandmother end up with a grandson in prison. And I, I tried to think, like, what, what would have happened in that child's childhood that could have led to this outcome? And so that's when the war on drugs thing kept coming up because I was seeing all these documentaries and reading a lot about it. And so I just started all over with a whole new storyline. And I had done that quite a bit with the first book that I told you, you know, took four years. I had done that about 15 times. In fact, today even I was looking at something because I'm, I'm writing something else and I was looking at an old draft of the first book that I wrote and I was like, oh, okay, so in this, this is the draft where I had four different blocks, but there are like 15 drafts. I mean, there are some where it's just one perspective, some where it's four perspectives, some where, but anyway, yeah, so I, I mean, yeah, I've done a lot of revision and just scrapping and starting all over and um, it's very difficult, I think, because you don't really know what that, you don't really know if you're going to get rewarded for it. You know, you, you just could be wasting your time. But I find that you really, you, you really get it all later. Like you get the fruit of that later. You know what I mean? And it, you're not sure when, but you do get it. Yeah, I think my revision process was very, um, I had the beginning and I had the end of the book when I started writing, but everything in the middle changed um, and I would just when I sat down to revise sometimes or to write more I would wind up just deleting things and so I would like sit down to write and then just have fewer words than when I started um, because that's kind of part of my process unfortunately um, and so even till the very last copy edited pass I was deleting things from the first page and they were like prying it from my hands. Um, but I think that, yeah, for me it was, um, uh, it was good that the format was, the, just like the form of the book was what it was because I could almost enter the story at random and then just like feel it out. That was really useful, I think, to me in the revision. I think, like I wish that the process that I had for this last book, um, would translate to a more efficient process for the next book, but I don't think that that's the way that it goes. Like, I think that each one is just its own problem. So for this book, it was really useful to me to have it in these really fragmented pieces because I was working a full-time job. I had to just work on this book when I had the time and getting to jump into it when I could um, and into these dated entries was really useful for me. And so for the next book, I don't know, maybe the revision process will be just like, typing it out once and typing it out again. I don't know. Like, I think it's all very idiosyncratic and specific, unfortunately. 
Um, I heard you both speaking to like this process of writing your books, and I was curious if you could speak more to how you sustained yourself through that process, like both financially, you're mentioning like a job, but also creatively and otherwise, like what kept you going through that process? Um, well, I think, you know, I, I see a former coworker here, so I'm disappointing her. I think I had something <laughs> to prove because I left my job. And it's like, well, this has to work out because you left your job, <laughs> you know. I think that was a lot of it, though. I really think um, just, I really felt like I, you know, it was a dream of mine. I, I, I put so much into it. I sacrificed a lot for it. And um, I, just, I just felt like, you know, I felt like it had to work out. But also, every time I would be on the verge of considering doing something else, I would get a nice little universal gift, like a gift from the universe. It would be like, oh, you got accepted to this random program. And it, it didn't necessarily go anywhere, but it would just be like a pick-me-up when I needed it, you know. And, um, and there, were, there were scattered things like that along the way that kept happening. My husband was very supportive, and um, he would always tell me that, you know, it was going to work out. It was just a matter of time. I just needed to keep going. My friends were telling me that stuff, too. So I think that's important, having, having a group of people who really believe in your vision for yourself. I can't stress that enough, because if you don't have that, your, your own vision is going to waver, because you're pounded with rejections. I mean, I've gotten hundreds of rejections. Seriously, I'm not exaggerating. So you have to have people in your corner who are like, I, I support. I support this vision for you, and I also see it as strongly as you see it, and it's like a shared thing that we all see, and I think that's just, I think that I can't say enough about how important that is. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I co-sign co on that. I, I also, um, I mean, I think that being a writer and writing a book was something that I had wanted to do all my life. Um, as a kid, just like reading books and wanting to be a writer of them. Um, but I think that I had always had this very practical side of me too. Um, again, like my parents wanting me to make money, me also wanting to just like support myself and not um, be a, a starving artist. And so I've always like worked as I've also been writing. And I think. Um, that what sustained me was just like the pleasure of writing itself. You know, obviously it's not always super fun, but I think that just like the privilege of getting to do it, um, it really doesn't take a lot. You can do it for free. <laughs> and you can do it just with, um, you know, an hour or even less than that. Sometimes it was just like half hour snatches before work. Um, and so I think just like the pleasure of getting to do it and um, how much fun it is, is what kept me going. But yeah, it sucks, and rejection sucks a lot. <laughs> and it's constant. Like, it never ends. No, we're still doesn't. getting rejected now, mm -hmm. even though we're up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm curious what piece of writing enabled you to find your literary agents, and why you think it was that piece that did it? Mm. If it was one. <laughs> well, for me, I actually, the book was finished before. I had an agent for my first book, um, but she couldn't sell it, so I, I had to end the relationship with her because it obviously wasn't going anywhere. And so I went another year after I ended the relationship with her with no agent. And, um, and that's when I started writing this book. And so I, I think I told you I did a year-long narrative program. The woman I did the year-long narrative program with was married to a publisher. And so she gave the publisher this book. And the publisher liked the book a lot, but needed an agent to buy it. So he got me an agent, which mm -hmm. never happens that way, right? It's just, mm -hmm. it's funny how I put in so much effort with the first <laughs> book, and it just was like, never really went anywhere. And this one, it just, it, it was, it, it, it's like people were coming to me for, I didn't have to look for an agent. The agent came. Um, for me, it was, the piece of writing was just this book. I mean, I, it was an earlier version of it, and I had been looking for agents for a little while, but the one that I'm with now um, signed on with this book, and uh, she's like my first reader for everything. I, f I finish a story, I just send it off to her, and she's the best. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I was just wondering how your, now that the books are done and all the editing is done and it's published and in print, how your relationship with your own book has changed. Like it seemed like both of you were having some, um, some insights tonight as a result of, of questions and comments and just sort of curious, you know, in general and anything in particular that you realized about your own book after you were done writing it? Um, I mean, it just, the process is so long and um, I think for me, it was interesting to just get back into the headspace of like writing this book and like all the things that I was feeling when I started this book, just tapping back into those feelings and remembering why I wrote the book. Um, because it does get, it, it just removed, I guess, you know, like it, it does feel like a lifetime ago almost that I, I started writing this, but it's relevant to memory in my case. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's definitely been exciting to hear from people who are reading it for the first time and encountering the material for the first time and, and then seeing it in a new way. And um, re, yeah, just reacquainting myself, I guess. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. It's, it feels very removed. Like, um, for instance, when I started doing interviews, I had to go back and reread it because people would ask me questions and I wouldn't know. I would have to think about it. And I'm yeah. like, oh yeah, it was 1944. Well, sometimes that's I'd be right. like, that's not in the book. Right. What are you talking about? And then I, and then I would go back and, yeah. Like, oh yeah, you know more than I do actually. Yeah, because they will have just read it and you haven't read it in a year. So you just, I just didn't, a lot of the stuff I didn't remember, so there's that. But then I, what I love about it being removed is that um, it's almost like it's alive in a different way. People are inserting their own meaning into it, and they'll tell you, oh, I love that you did it this way because of that. And that's not the reason I did it that way. But okay, that's great that you love it. I think that's awesome. And, I, and that's what it is with any kind of art. When you put it out into the world, people will receive it, and they'll put meaning on it. And I think that's really cool. Um, I always say I, I wish I could read this book as a reader, though. That's what I really miss. Like I'm, mm. I wish that I could. I don't have the experience that other readers will have of it, and I miss that because they talk to me about the impact it had, and they talk to me about the characters they love, and I'll never be able to go freshly into this book and feel that. So that's the mm. only thing that I miss because when I was first writing it, there was more, a little bit more of that there. Like you know, you, you're getting live feedback that you're incorporating, and you're just not as distant from it. So you do feel more, um, it just feels more fresh. But now, I, yeah, I, I'll, never, I'll never see it that way. So that's kind of a bummer. Hi. Um, I wonder if either of you would ever um, take, say, a, a real family situation, you know, from your own families, and and use that as a, I don't know, a prompt, uh, you know, for for writing fiction. And where is that? So creatively, where where is that dividing line between fact and fiction? Can they play off each other in a in an interesting way that ends up being a piece of fiction that works? I, I'm struggling with something like yeah. that right now. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I would love to do that. I would. But my family would never forgive me. But I would, I would love because my family is very rich. They have, you know, with their material, they have a lot going on. So I could really get into that. But you know, I try to just if I do it, I try to by the end of the process get really removed from it so that they wouldn't recognize themselves. But um, but you know, people write memoirs, and and I have my editor writes memoirs, and she says that she writes the. Um, she writes her family right before it gets published, and she says, you know, these are the ways in which I mention you. If you have any issue with that, please let me know, and I can put it in an addendum in the book. And so that's how she handles it. But I mean, people have so many ways of handling it. And um, I will say, I do write personal, I'm starting to write personal essays. And um, so far, I've just done it in a way that's really, um, that's, that it's not too hard on any of the people mentioned. But at a certain point, if I continue to write personal essays, they're not all going to be able to be like that. So I'm cognizant of that, and I'm curious myself to see how I'm going to handle it. Yeah, I think for me, I, um, I write fiction for a reason, and mm -hmm. it's definitely not 
memoir, like I, I think that that has never really interested me, um, just like writing something true. Like that's why I'm doing this and not the other thing. Um, but I do think that fiction is a blend of all of these different things, right? There's a big imagination component. There's also observation and then there's um, stuff that actually happened to you. And so in this book, I definitely stole a lot of stuff from like ex-boyfriends. Um, and so far they have not hunted me down for anything. So <laughs> I think you just be, just be brave and just do it. <laughs> and the thing is like, yeah, fiction does take on a life of its own. At least for me, it has always done that. Where like even, in, like Margaret has said, like you start with the seed of somebody or just like some impression or some encounter and then most people don't know that you're stealing from them because they don't even no, remember. <laughs> it's so true. I've noticed that. This will be our last question right here. It feels like a lot of pressure. Um, what I wanted to ask about was um, research. And Margaret, you had mentioned that you kind of write through the story and then go back and fill in the holes. And I'm just wondering if you could both, if you could talk a little more about that, and if Rachel, you could talk a little about what role research played um, in the novels, like, you know, what were the questions that you were asking that you were, you know, down the Wikipedia wormhole about, and, um, and especially this question coming from someone who's just never even, you know, attempted to write something with the complexity of either of your novels. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, well, for... For this book, yes, I did do the whole, I did all the drafts first, and then I did the research. I'm pretty sure I did it that way. Yeah. And then um, this book had to be heavily researched because, you know, like a part of it was in the 40s. And, um, and mm. then the 80s, I knew fairly well. I grew up in New Orleans in the 80s, but the, the whole war on drugs thing had to be researched. And then post-Katrina, just getting into the mindset of a 20-something-year-old man who's in and out of jail you know, that was also heavily researched, more anecdotally than the other two sections, which were based on reading. But, um, but yeah, it, it, this book actually, I would say half of the time spent on it was research, if not more. But um, I'm writing something now that's not that way. It's, you know, I'll do some research, but it won't be that much. And I actually think, for me, I'll say the, this book requiring so much research made it richer because it really opens the door when you start when you start reading about the history of something or when you just start listening to people tell their stories about stuff, it actually opens the door to more um, story avenues you can go down. And I actually think it's a it's a it's a disadvantage for the book I'm working on now that there that there isn't as much research involved because I just won't get as much like um, contribution of material if if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of research for this book too. Um, just I think researching in my process is always like something that I do when I can't just write. <laughs> and so I think that it adds layers to whatever you're working on. It adds complexity and yeah, it's good to have context I think for what you're writing about. And so I would sort of, um, if I felt really stuck, I would try to, like I would either go like sit outside or like take a walk, or I would go down some kind of terrible internet wormhole. <laughs> and like, I spent a lot of time just like reading caregiver forums like um, on the internet or just, uh, yeah, there were just lots of different things that could be, I think, in any piece of writing, right, that can be researched or that it doesn't hurt to know more about than whatever your own experience with it is. And so um, I, I found it really helpful when, when I was stuck. You know, like I think sometimes you, you do feel like you just can't write. Like writing is the hardest thing in the world. And so when that happened, I would do research and feel at least a little bit productive. On that note. <laughs> Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. <laughs> we want to thank you for your inspiring words and also hope that we've inspired you. If you're writers or readers, um, 
I think this was a wonderful panel, and we hope that you'll join us for our upcoming events through the week for Litquake and also out there through the city. It's a fantastic week ahead. Um, thank you for joining us at Mechanics Institute, and good night. Thank and you. The, the authors are available to sign books now. <laughs>